Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. October is always Halloween month. Ghosts, goblins, ghouls, costumes, and trick-or-treating. We now find ourselves in October, in the year of our Lord, 2020. Forget just Halloween. Most of us have been donning masks for seven months now. I mean, seriously, did you ever in your wildest dreams imagine a time when you could legit walk into a bank with a mask on and not get arrested? Yeah, me neither. Crazy. So this year's Halloween presents most parents with a big decision. Stay home on Halloween or let the kids venture out and go trick-or-treating. Employers face a dilemma of their own. Keep employees home or start bringing people back into the office. As lawyers, we know that that decision entails legal challenges. One of those challenges involves properly navigating the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. Wait, the ADA? Shouldn't returning to work and battling COVID be the same for all employees? Are there really ADA considerations at play? If so, how? These are not rhetorical questions. If you have any doubts, just ask Kelly Fuquay, an associate in the Austin office of Littler Mendelssohn. Kelly practices employment law in state and federal courts and in alternative dispute resolution settings, and she's been kind enough to share her insights on the ADA and COVID-19 in the October 2020 issue of the Texas Bar Journal. Kelly has co-authored an article alongside Natalie Marion and fellow Littler colleague Allison Williams. The title of the article, Navigating the ADA in the Time of COVID. Be on the lookout for it, but we wanted to take this opportunity to get some additional insights straight from the source. Yes, that's right. Kelly Fuquay has graciously joined our conversation today. Kelly, welcome. Hi, Rocky. I'm so happy to be here. Absolutely. Now, you're you're in beautiful Austin, and I'm in I'm in beautiful DFW. Is 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 Austin kind of getting back to normal again, or is it still subdued? I would say that Austin was never really subdued during this whole <laughs> pandemic, unfortunately. <laughs> but yes, I do notice more people are out and about, going out to restaurants. I know that a lot of people are looking forward to the bars reopening soon <laughs> at half capacity inside. So, and, and when we say the bars, we mean actual drinking establishments, not the local bar associations. Correct. I think yes. the local bar associations, yeah, they've been fully functional this whole time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or just as dysfunctional holes. as normal. Yes, exactly. So now before we dive into the ADA, I wanted to point out something to, to the listeners. You are, at least according to my intel, you're a tried and true Longhorn because you went to UT undergrad and UT law school. I did hook them. I um, paid a lot of money to go to school there for seven years. So I bleed burnt <laughs> orange. I think that makes you what they call an official fangirl, if I'm not mistaken. I will accept that title. Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Now, what ignited your interest in employment law? What, what kind of sparked that? So when I was going to law school, um, I think there's this idea that everyone has some sort of passion or they know what they want to do. I, I didn't really. And then I started taking employment law classes in law school and I was involved in a clinic in law school for workers' rights. And it became really clear to me that employment law is really interesting because it's one of the most prevalent topics in, you know, everyday people's lives as well, right? Like most people have had jobs in the past or will in the future. And so employment law affects everyone. Sure. So that makes it really interesting. It's also really interesting because it's constantly evolving, right? And I mean, we see that firsthand with the pandemic. Employment law was one of the areas of the law that it we were hit, but we were hit because we had an influx of questions and employers needed to know, well, what do I do? How do I navigate <laughs> furloughs and what's the Warren right. Act and all of that? So it's constantly evolving, which is something that was important to me when I was choosing a career. I never wanted to get bored and I always wanted to be learning and I am doing that for sure in my current job. Now, let's let's just talk basics before we get into the real heart of your article and and employment law issues in the pandemic. For those that maybe don't practice employment law or for those who are non-lawyers that are listening in, sure. can you give us a broad overview of what is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act? A 
Of course, yeah. I think there's a tendency for when we talk about the ADA or any types of laws, we use legalese. But in its <laughs> essence, the ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it was signed into law relatively recently in 1990, the year I was born. And then it was Oh, amended. don't go there. No, <laughs> good Lord. Oh, gee, that, that hurt. That hurt. It, it just, it's, it seems so new, right? And I, some people don't realize that. And it was amended in 2008 to include a lot of the provisions that we really talk about today. But essentially, the job of the ADA is to prohibit employers, private employers, state and local governments, employment agencies, labor unions from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities in applying for jobs, hiring decisions, firing decisions, training decisions. So it, it prevents discrimination against people with disabilities in any part of the employment process, essentially. Now, talk to us about what a reasonable accommodation means, because in, in your article, I saw that, that term coming up and lawyers will know what it means, but let's just kind of go over that real quick to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Of course. Like I said, we like to make things really complicated in the law and give things um, really technical definitions. So reasonable accommodation is essentially any change to the application process, the hiring process, the job that somebody is doing or the way somebody's doing their job or their work environment. And it's something that allows a person with a disability who is qualified for their job to perform the essential functions of that job and to enjoy equal employment opportunities. Again, those are all very technical legal definitions. So being qualified for your job and performing the essential functions, et cetera, et cetera. But it's essentially anything that you, an employer can give to an employee to make sure that that employee can perform the essential functions of their job. Despite whatever disabilities they might present with, I suppose, right? Exactly, yes. Now, there's, there's, also, there's also an ADAA, or the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act. Now, does that have any bearing on, on this whole COVID situation as well, or are we primarily concerned with the ADA itself? We're primarily concerned with the ADA that sort of subsumes everything that we're talking about, is how okay. I would phrase the issue. Okay, so ADA yeah. is like this all-encompassing term that covers the ADAA as well. Okay. Yeah. See, I, I asked a technical employment question for all the for all the employment law nerds out there. <laughs> See, I, I knew what the ADAA was. So there. Now, yeah. in, in your view and in, in your experience, are there disabilities where an employee might have a legit, let's say a legitimate reason to say, I don't want to wear a mask because I've got a disability. I mean, is, I, I can see that issue coming up or people having that question. Absolutely. Yeah. That? Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and I think that that's something that, so tracking back a little bit, as we talked about, this pandemic presents a whole new ball game of questions specifically sure. related to the ADA and the EEOC, which is the um, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They're the federal agency in charge of really implementing and making sure that the ADA is followed. Right. Um, they were like, well, everyone's going to have a lot of questions. People are having a lot of questions. People are submitting a lot of questions. And they issued really comprehensive guidance that is amazing um, that talks about all of these issues that people were wondering. And one of those issues is, you know, well, what if I have an employee that shows up and they say they can't wear a mask because of a disability that they have, for example? And in that case, the employer has the right and should start engaging in what is called the interactive process to determine, you know, if that person does have a disability, and that can include requesting medical information, a doctor's note, for example, and then figuring out what accommodation to give that person. So is the accommodation of not wearing a mask at all, is that reasonable? I don't know. You have to figure it out in the context of what type of company you are. So for example, if, if this is an employee at a hospital that has a COVID wing, it's probably not going to be reasonable. You're not going to want that person walking around without a mask, right? So then you engage in what's called the interactive process, which again is a fancy legal word that it can just be distilled into figuring out what accommodation you can give that person that would help that person that would allow them to perform the essential functions of their job, but also, you know, is related to like helps fulfill your business necessities too at the same time. To those of us who maybe don't have a recognized disability. It sounds like such a simple thing, right? You just, you return to work, you check temperatures, you, sure. 
you, you ask people, you know, do you have the following symptoms? Have you had a sore throat? And, right, and, right. and just kind of go through the laundry list. But for employees with with recognized disabilities, what might their unique struggles be when it comes to returning to work? It goes back to the question about wearing a mask, right? That's one of the most common things is wearing sure. a mask or what type of PPE people with disabilities that might be triggered by that sort of stuff. That's a big question. I think also, I think you're talking about physical disabilities, right? Like you can see them, but also you have to consider mental illness and whether or not those are disabilities and how somebody with debilitating anxiety, figuring out if that's a disability and how you accommodate those people, whether or not they're returning to work or continuing to work from home, which could be an accommodation of some sort. So I feel like it really runs the spectrum of you know wearing a mask to, I need to work at home because I have severe debilitating anxiety and I can't enter the workplace and accomplish my job every day for you. Now, when you talk about mental illness or, or even certain physical illnesses, I can I can see there being a question that employers might raise about does this employee really have this illness? Or are right. they trying to get are they trying to use this as as an opportunity to get an accommodation that otherwise would not be available to them? Sure. So is there advice you can give employers about how to how to get to the bottom of what is a legitimate disability and what might not be? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be the same basic inquiry and engaging in the interactive process to figure out whether or not this is a disability, right? So that's requesting medical documentation if needed. So if you say to this employee, well, could you please provide a doctor's note that describes your condition and then determine whether or not that condition meets the definition of disability. And then if it does, sitting down with that employee or having a, a Zoom call, right, mm -hmm. to figure out what sort of accommodation they want, right? And so if that's an accommodation that works for you, that's awesome. You're like, great, I'll give you this accommodation. I'd be happy to let you work from home if that's going to help you accomplish your job. But if it's something, I mean, outlandish and way expensive, if it poses an undue hardship, which right. I'm bringing that legalese back oh, in. Sure. Inter alia, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, right, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nunk pro tunk. Oh, oh, you're throwing down now. Okay. I'm going to bring out my Latin dictionary. You you just engage in the interactive process, and that's that's the one thing that stayed the same. You figure out what accommodation they want. Does that accommodation work? Great. Give it to them. Does it not? Offer different solutions. If one of those solutions works for the employee, perfect. Then give them that accommodation. You mentioned a couple of times about maybe getting a doctor's note. Sure. Now, let's say, again, I'm just trying to... I'm trying to think through this. If if I'm an employer in that situation, let's say I don't necessarily think that the employee went to a legit doctor, right? They, they went to a doctor who's willing to write whatever just to help their patient out. Can I, or do I have the right under the ADA to kind of say, look, I want to get an independent medical examination. I want you to go to a doctor of my choosing and get me a note. Or does the employee get to choose their own? And do I just kind of have to take it at face value? My understanding in answer to your question is that the ADA does not permit you to request, I guess it would be a second opinion sort of right. in this situation, unless the doctor's note that you received has insufficient information on its face okay. to really substantiate that employee's allegations. Like it can't be, I've heard of this doctor because he has crazy billboards or crazy ads, I think he's a quack, so right. I'm going to request a second opinion. You need to have a basis looking at this doctor's note to figure out, you know, you have to say, this doesn't give me enough information to determine that this is a disability. I'm going to need a second opinion. So it's got to be prima facie. Yes, sure. Hey, That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, 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 just because I don't know what nunk pro tunk is doesn't mean I don't, I don't know either. what prima facie is. Yeah, I, I have to look that up every single time, like nunk pro tunk. Who came up with this? But now let's talk about things like COVID testing. Okay. So, sure, yeah. so, you know, it's not uncommon to go places where they, or for employers to say, you know, we want to test you to make sure you're not bringing the virus in. Absolutely. You know, are there issues where, I mean, to, to most people that would seem like a no brainer. You just go test people, but. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times employees think that's a good benefit too. It's pretty cool to go and say, well, my employer is giving me free COVID testing. Why not take advantage of that? But until so, they stick the swab up your nose and <laughs> twirl it around for 15 seconds, then you realize it's not so cool anymore. Yeah, and you but. have a migraine for five days because they touched <laughs> your brain, maybe. Um, so the, the EEOC has said that in this situation, because of all the guidance we have from the CDC, we know this is a bad 
thing, right? So Mm -hmm. you can administer COVID testing to your employees. You cannot, and this is one thing that the EEOC was really stressing back when the question was posed, you cannot require antibody testing because it's so questionable, it's sketchy, people don't really know how effective it is. Mm. So don't do antibody testing. You can't require that from your employees and under the ADA and the guidance that the EEOC has given, but you can administer um, COVID testing. You should make sure, one caveat to that is you should make sure whatever test you are using has been approved by the CDC, like it meets all of the standards that COVID testing should meet. You shouldn't go right. borrow Don't your Don't give friend. him a field sobriety test. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Your friend yeah. John said that he's developing a cool test in his basement. Yeah, don't use that <laughs> one. <laughs> Get an approved test and then you're good to go, but don't use an antibody test either. Has any, maybe you can't answer this, but has anybody actually used the John from the basement test? I don't know that. In my experience, I have not heard that. So that's okay. good, right? Phew. For me, but I, was, I you I know, like, I wouldn't be surprised. Weird, weird things are happening this no, year in no, the world. I mean, look, as I get older, I realize there, there, there are no limits to human genius or human stupidity. I like that. So we've talked about, you know, certain types of reasonable accommodations, but do you have any concrete examples? I mean, without, without revealing anything, you know, attorney client privilege, but are there, sure. are there examples of reasonable accommodations that, that have come up and that employers have been able to implement that have been helpful? Yeah, of course. And again, I'm harking back to the EEOC guidance because they came out really early on and gave really comprehensive advice and that's being put into practice for me firsthand. So some of the things that come to mind Teleworking can be an accommodation for some people. So if part of the job requires somebody to be present, if somebody can do their work from home and still accomplish the essential functions, that could be considered an accommodation in this Mm -hmm. context. But also you're getting into more practical accommodation for people who do need to show up, such as putting the plexiglass barriers around people. So it's sort of like a plexiglass cubicle sure. at your desk instead. That's something that happens, you know, getting different kinds of PPE. So if that's like providing face shields, for example, instead of cotton masks or something like that, that's an option. I remember one of the interesting ones that the EEOC put in their guidance, I think, had to do with changing traffic patterns. So in, I guess, in high huh. volume okay office spaces with a bunch of desks or something like that, like making sure people are all walking one direction and then exiting a different direction so that you're not passing face to face, I think is the solution One way hallways. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the whole idea here is get creative, figure out what practical solutions you can implement to assuage people's fears or accommodate them if it's an actual disability. Mm -hmm. Build an underpass under the <laughs> under the front desk. Yes. That would be great, right? <laughs> yes, it would. I, I, I'd want to see that one. But one thing that your article talked about was accommodations in the remote working context. Now, you just talked about remote working as an accommodation. Yeah, yeah. But are there are there situations where an employer might need to give somebody an accommodation while they are remote working? Yes. So, for example, if somebody so. Before we all started working from home in March, many months ago, if you had an employee who you had given maybe special software or something like that, that allowed them to perform their job at their desk in a way that they needed to accommodate their disability, then that person might not have that same software at their home setup if they even have a home setup. So maybe you need to get them that for their teleworking setup. So that's something. So it's really figuring out what accommodations you had going for your employees in the physical Mm -hmm. office space and whether or not those can be easily transitioned to a work from home space. A lot of people already have a work from home space that fully satisfies their needs, but you should make sure that if they don't to provide whatever they need to accomplish the essential functions of their job. Now, this might be a bit of a sticky question, but let's just say that, let's say that you're remote working, somebody has a, a work from home space, but they, they're not used to using it, you know, for eight to 10 hours a day. Sure. It's a kitchen table. And mm-hmm. so it turns out that for their situation, they need a standing desk or they need some kind of ergonomic chair. Okay. Is that, is that on the employer to provide under the ADA or, or is that something that since it's at home, it now falls to the employee? 
Well, I think the key question there is whether you are requiring the person to work from home. If you if you are, if your business place is shut down and that person has to be working from home to accomplish their job, then yes, you should engage in in the interactive process. And if it's feasible, if y'all decide that providing a standing desk is a reasonable accommodation, that it does not pose an undue hardship, yeah, get on the standing desk, right? You want that person to be, I think there's an idea that like, no employers want to provide any accommodations, which is totally not true. Most employers, they do. They want to figure out how they can make their employees most productive because you're helping the company, right? Well, sure. So yeah, if, if that's something they need, figure that out. But if you have an inkling, like you said, that they're just working from their kitchen island because they don't want to set up another space or something like that, like that's part of the interactive process, engaging, figuring out what the situation is, how you can help them. If it's a disability, what can you do to accommodate it? Well, I guess what's interesting to me is that before there was there was remote working that was kind of an exception to the rule, and now it's becoming the rule. Right, And yeah. so I kind of wonder out loud, you know, at what point does the home office become an extension of the main office for Absolutely. purposes of things like, you know, workers' comp or, or you know, workplace harassment or what, you know, all these other employment law issues that, that arise, does the home now... And and to what extent, you know, how do you how do you kind of demarcate between yeah. the time when the person's at home and when the person is working from home? Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the biggest you mentioned some issues, but I think the most interesting area of employment law that will be impacted if this is a a permanent change in the way that we have our offices set up is wage and hour issues. Right. That's been a hot topic. Like if you have hourly employees, how do you know when they're actually stopping work and mm-hmm. how are you documenting overtime and all of that stuff. So yeah, it's going to, like I said, employment law is always changing. And it's, if this is a permanent situation, which I think you're right, it might be, um, then we're going to have a lot of these issues to deal with going forward. Or does remote working kind of become a benefit? And totally. So, yeah. So, you know, in, in some cases we're saying, well, now you have to work from home because we have no choice, but then there may come a point at which you say, well, working from home is a benefit. And then at what point does that same framework apply? Because you're doing this to favor the employee, but now there's issues arising from that benefit. So right, I, I, right. I, I, I don't know if, if you're anticipating that issue or if it's no, talking I think that's, totally, if I'm just totally nunk pro tunk on this, because I still don't know <laughs> what nunk pro tunk means. We're just a, assigning a meaning to that phrase. Um, yes. I, I think that's totally right. I mean, the grass is always greener, right? So if we all start working from home for 10 years, I'm sure there will be people in 10 years who are like, man, I really wish there was a cool office to go into <laughs> every day, especially extroverts like me. Like I, I miss the office and being around my coworkers. So well, sure. I don't think you're creating an issue. I think there are going to be a lot of issues moving forward with figuring out teleworking under the ADA and otherwise. Let's shift gears slightly and talk about the nightmare scenario, right? You, you, oh, you, you're, everybody's in the office and and turns out we've got a COVID positive employee. Yep. Now, most employers I think would and probably should at least let the other employees know that there's a COVID positive person and here's mm-hmm. what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, talk to us if you would about the confidentiality issues arising there, especially with regards to the to the COVID positive employee. Yeah. So under the ADA, you have to keep employees' medical information confidential, first of all. And also you have to store it apart from their personnel file. So you can't keep Betty's medical information (laughs) in the same manila folder that you have her employment application and her, you know, disciplinary file, for example. So that's the two overarching themes here. If you do get a COVID positive employee in the workspace, yes, you should obviously take the right measures to inform people who may have been exposed. But the big caveat there is that you do not ever reveal somebody's personal identifying information. You don't tell people the person's name. You don't say... (laughs) Well, I'm I'm not going to tell you the name, but you had lunch with this person on right. September 5th, and that's how I know that you may have been exposed. Like people can put two <laughs> and two together eventually, especially in smaller workplaces. Like sometimes it's inevitable that people are going to figure out who the exposed person is. Right. Um, but yeah, don't ever give away somebody's name or enough information that would really out someone without 
people even having to do any sort of mental gymnastics to get there themselves. Um, and if you get that information in written copy, definitely put it in a confidential place. Um, and that's another issue that arises in teleworking. Because if you have these supervisors getting confidential medical information about people that have been exposed to COVID or have been diagnosed positive from COVID, like how do supervisors store confidential medical information in their house when they have a spouse and five kids running around. Like right. that's, that's a real practical problem. You have to figure <laughs> out how, where do people store this information? You have to make sure if they can store it the same way that they would in the office that they're doing that. So, so don't put it in the glove box in your car. <laughs> yeah. And don't put it on your fridge with your kid's artwork or anything like that. So you remember it later. L- let's talk for a second about about mental health, because you you alluded to this earlier. Yes. But what are some of the mental mental health concerns that the pandemic is bringing on that you've been kind of encountering in your work? Yeah, I think the big issue is just how much havoc this pandemic wreaks on people's mental state in general, whether that be, you know, triggering some past trauma you've experienced or anxiety related to just navigating the world right now or anxiety related to, am I going to get laid off? You know, it could be so many different things. And I think that in the pandemic, people who might have had anxiety before or it had had been managed in a certain way before, it's exacerbated now. And so figuring out for those employees who I've mentioned it before, like have, it's affecting their ability to do their job, figuring out if that's a disability and and if you can accommodate it, getting the doctor's note, if you need it, whatever, figuring out what those people need to help them perform the essential functions of their job. I think it's top of mind for a lot of employers right now. And a lot of employers are providing, you know, even extra benefits like counseling, et cetera, which can come in handy for people whose anxiety does rise to a level of disability and just people who have anxiety in general. So that's what we're seeing a lot of right now. Is that a typical type of accommodation you're seeing? It's it's counseling services sponsored yeah, by the employer? Sure. Well, and I think that that can be an accommodation if that's what you and the employee agree on. And you're like, okay, counseling would help me right now. That would enable me to perform the essential functions of my job. And also some... Yeah, yeah. And Schedule some, breaks and saying, hey, exactly. take some time off. Okay. Yep, if they need leave or something like that, or if they need uh, to shorten their schedule. If maybe the anxiety is triggered by having to go into a workplace where being physically present in the office is required now, maybe you figure out a way to let that employee telework if it alleviates the anxiety or allows them to perform their job. Maybe that's an option. Mm. Again, flexibility is key in engaging and just having an open conversation. How can I help you help me? Right, right. Let's kind of think a little bit long term now. Now, your article focuses on the ADA in the context of this COVID pandemic. Yes. Do you think this is kind of a one-off situation that we're facing? Or, you know, what do you think we're going to take forward in, in the employment law context past COVID-19? Once, once this is behind us, Do you think this is going to change employment law? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. I think that one of the big changes that we will see is that employers are enacting different policies that are not temporary policies that will be in place long term. And whether that's related to, um, I mean, it could be related to anything. It could be a wage and hour issue, uh, working from home, teleworking policies. Sure. For example, I think that you're going to see a lot of Policy changes happening right now in reaction to the pandemic, but that will not change when the pandemic, when quarantine is over. I think that Mm. the workplace is shifting entirely. And I think that, you know, even when we get a vaccine, I've been talking with some of my friends, it's going to take a while for people to feel comfortable around people. Like, how do we interact face to face with our coworkers in the future? It's going to feel weird. We're all going to be a little awkward, probably. Um, And so I think that there might be heightened sensitivities when people are returning to work eventually, whenever that happens, if it's, if it's already happened, for example, or if it's happening next July, I don't know. I think that, I think that a a lot of complaints are going to be filed and employers should be prepared to handle those or, you know, not complaints necessarily, grievances, you know, just be willing to work with your employees and employees be willing to voice concerns when they have them to troubleshoot all of these issues as they arise. Right. 
it's like Roger sneezed in his hand and then and then touched me, you know, that kind of stuff. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think that people are going to be on high alert when we get back to the office. I feel like I will be because it's it's strange going out in public and seeing people these days. Yeah, it's, it, I think we're a lot more germ aware. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> than, than we once were. Well, well, Kelly, this has been fascinating and, and thought provoking. And for anybody out there that's ever contemplated a a career in employment law, I think you've just shown them how very interesting and multifaceted it can be. I hope so. so yeah, absolutely. I feel that way. Well, you know, we have run out of time, unfortunately, but the good thing is that we can all learn a bit more about this by delving into your article yes. in the October 2020 issue of the Texas Bar Journal. So again, Kelly, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was really fun. Now, and of course, I want to thank you for tuning in and encourage you to stay safe. Make sure you follow all applicable orders for dealing with COVID-19 and please advise your clients and loved ones to do the same. This situation is changing fluidly and quickly, so please seek out legal counsel, like Kelly, if you have any (laughs) questions. And if you like what you heard today, please rate and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off for now. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to texasbar.com slash podcasts, subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.